Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim McKercher, and I'm a provincial coordinator with the Alzheimer's Society of BC. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's guest speakers, Pam and Melody, who will be presenting an introduction to advanced care planning. Pam Martin is the evaluation lead for the BC Centre for Palliative Care. Pam has over 15 years of evaluation experience in community development and public health and has volunteered in hospices for almost 20 years. She is passionate about end of life care and recently has become a certified end of life doula. And then we have also Melody Jobes with us. She is the community engagement lead at the BC Centre for Palliative Care. She helps to inspire and partner with organizations in BC to foster initiatives that help increase awareness and understanding about living and dying well. With nearly 30 years in the not-for-profit sector, she has seen firsthand how community education informs and strengthens the lives of people in our communities. So on behalf of the Alzheimer's Society, I'd like to give you a warm welcome. Uh, so thank you, Pam and Melody, for being here today and joining us to discuss this important topic on advanced care planning. So thank you so, so much, uh, both Kim and Lori and Alzheimer's BC. We are thrilled to be able to present and uh, support uh, the community around uh, with advanced care planning. So uh, my wishes, my care, this is an introduction to advanced care planning. We would uh, like to respectfully, first of all, acknowledge the history, the customs and the culture of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish and Salatooth nations, and recognize that we are presenting to you today from their traditional territory and home. We would also like to acknowledge the many nations where you are all located. So today we will be giving an overview and an introduction to advanced care planning that includes the what, the why, the who, and the when of advanced care planning. Uh, we will look at how to start the advanced care planning process and where to find the resources. I'm gonna start our uh, workshop off with just an overview from a story from a delightful woman named Myrna. My name is Myrna Norman, and I'm so glad to be here with you all. It's my honor to speak to you today. 13 years ago, I was dumbfounded, absolutely dumbfounded, to be given a diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia by my doctor. He also told me, and I quote, he said, go home and get your affairs in order. Any questions? I didn't have any. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Shock and disbelief were mixed with the why me syndrome. We called the children, we all got together, we discussed what we needed to do. We made changes to our living arrangements, we sold our big house, we bought a condo closer to the children. Um, the first few years were really hard, but after that, I, I came to terms with, with it, I educated myself, and, um, and I learned that I had a responsibility and a choice to live happy. Other doors have opened. I've written a book. I actually enjoy writing poetry and, uh, and painting with acrylics. I, I am a person living with an expertise, and I've been asked to sit on a dozen committees from Canada-wide to local BC to local community committees, and I was a keynote speaker at UBC. So I became an advocate for people living with dementia, and I strive to be the best advocate I can. When my husband died, uh, of a lengthy illness. He wasn't able to discuss the illness, nor was he able to talk about his final wishes. So when he passed away, all that responsibility to make those arrangements fell on me and the children. And it was a very difficult time because we were facing uh, grief and anger and sorrow and particularly me i was filled with guilt did i do the right thing is that what he wanted done what were his wishes i knew his values but i didn't know what he wanted and that made it really really difficult for this reason i have done and will continue to do and update my advanced care plan Making 
decisions is not a very sad thing. It, it's actually a right of citizenship. I've learned that like other people living with dementia, I have a right to make my own decisions. Imagine that people with dementia have a right to make their own decisions. Having my decisions honored and sharing my wishes with those I choose is a rite of passage. There have been many misleading suggestions about my abilities, but I have the right to make my decisions. Full stop. Just do it is my new mantra. As with my advanced care plan and my annual revisit to confirm those wishes in my plan, I'm going to stay busy and do things I enjoy. I'm going to learn from others on this journey of dementia. Thank you. But this time I'd like to introduce and pass the baton to Pam Martin for the next section of our workshop. Thank you, Melody. Uh, so we'll start this, uh, this presentation off with asking what is advanced care planning? So, Advanced care planning is an important part of life planning. Uh, we would say that it's just as important as wills and estates planning and financial planning. Advanced care planning helps you prepare for your future health care and personal care. So in Canada, when you're ill and need care, you can choose whether to say yes or no to tests, examinations and treatments uh, your health care provider recommends. Your healthcare provider cannot provide care that you don't want or don't agree to, except, uh, of course, in some emergency situations. When making a healthcare decision, you, the patient, have the right to agree to medical treatment, refuse treatment, stop treatment that has already started, and either agree or refuse to participate in any form of research if you don't want to. So to help you make decisions, uh, you have the right to information. Um, that means uh, information that will help you understand the decisions you're trying to make and weigh the risks and benefits. The right to have your communication needs met. So for example, um, you can ask for a language interpreter if you don't speak the language. You can also communicate your decision using uh, either body language or nonverbal gestures. You also receive, uh, have the right to receive support from the people you trust to help you make a decision. So, for example, you can ask a family member or a friend to help you understand the information given to you and communicate that with your health care providers. Slide. So, advanced care planning um, helps you plan ahead for future care decisions. It's a process of thinking about your values, beliefs and wishes for future health care and personal care uh, and sharing them with the people that you trust. It can include choosing who would make care decisions for you if you cannot. So, as we know, serious illness or injury can happen to us at any time. Advanced care planning can help you get the care that's right for you, even if you're too ill or injured to speak for yourself. In the next section, we're going to talk about why is advanced care planning important? Well, advanced care planning benefits you, your family and friends, and your health care providers. It, first of all, reassures you that your wishes are known and can be respected. Um, it's also a gift for your family and friends that reassures them that they would know what you want, uh, which reduces the stress, anxiety, conflict, things that can, can happen when people are unsure and want to provide the best care for you. Um, it also lets your healthcare providers consider the treatments and care options that are consistent with your wishes. Who should do advanced care planning? And, uh, the short answer is everyone, everyone should do it. Um, so advanced care planning is for all adults, uh, not just people who are older or seriously ill. It's also a process, which means it can evolve and should be revisited multiple times throughout a person's lifetime. Um, when should you do advanced care planning? Well, the center uh, likes to say the sooner we start advanced care planning, the better. Um, so, as we know, our health can change in an absolute instance. So, advanced care planning can help you get the care that's right for you during the times of illness or injury if you cannot make those decisions for yourself. Um, that said, if you are somebody who is living with a serious illness or chronic condition, it's especially important for you uh, to get started sooner rather than later. That, I will pass it over to Melody. Thank you, Pam. 
So you can see we did a little bit of the elementary school, who, what, when, where, why, right. and now we're gonna do the how question of how do you do advanced care planning? And um, I think this will break down what maybe is seemingly complex. We really um, understand advanced care planning to be talked about in three simple steps. Think, talk, plan. If you can remember these three words and what they mean, you will be on the way to understanding why it's important. So we're going to cover mostly the first two steps today, think and talk, because the planning components will go over, but we will explain these elements. So first of all, thinking about what matters to you when it comes to your health care and your future health care. What matters most to you? Um, and who could make a healthcare personal decision? Sorry, I'm on the other slide. Who could make the healthcare and personal decisions for you if you could not? And then we'll talk about talking, discussing our thoughts with the people that you trust, talk to your healthcare providers, and then we'll cover the planning component, which is to record your wishes and sharing your plan with the people you trust and your healthcare providers. The first element is think. Think what matters most to you. Um, that's a really broad question. It might matter to you the sun is shining, but when it comes to what matters most to you about your health care and your future health care. So what matters most are your personal, what we would call values, beliefs, and wishes. So your personal values are the things that are important to you in life and things that you wish could continue even if you became seriously ill. Your beliefs are the spiritual or cultural practices that are important to you. Um, practices that influence the options of care that may be considered for you. And um, beliefs also include life, lifestyle, and capacity as to how you're living. And lastly, your values and belief then form personal wishes. So, for example, how and where you would want to be cared for, things that you would like to have with you, people you would like to have around you. So thinking about what, are, what matters most to you helps to inform your future care decisions. So I'm just going to give you a moment to think about it. Here's, here's just a very few starter questions. Think about what matters most to you. And as I read them, you might want to jot them down on paper. You will be able to access this um, presentation, of course. But just while we're engaged for the moment, what is something that always makes you smile? What are some of the activities or routines that make your day enjoyable? And what does quality of life mean to you? They're big questions. Maybe you already know the answers. We um, at the BC Center, we know and we wholeheartedly believe that the best way to get the care that aligns with your values and beliefs and wishes is to start a conversation. And the tool that we have has a number of series uh, questions that are easy to begin this conversation. So we would say use the questions to start a conversation with the people you trust. It might be a family, it might be a friend. Because advanced care planning is a process of thinking, we recognize that all these questions you're not going to be doing all at once, but they may come up over a series of conversations over time. So for instance, one question you could ask is, do you know my thoughts about being an organ donor? Are you an organ donor? And does your family or your uh, loved ones know that? Another question that people might think of uh, is, who would I feel most comfortable with helping me with my personal care? That'll get people thinking, but sometimes it's the opposite. So who might I not be comfortable with with my personal care? These are all part of discussing what matters most to you in future care. So I just wanna say that what we're showing here, and Kim just threw that in the chat, to start the conversation and all of this, you will receive these as um, attachments uh, with the links that you can access this resource um, after our presentation as well. So there's some conversation starters to help you think about what matters most. So the other part of think then is who would make decisions for you if you could not? 
If you are a caregiver or a family member caring for a loved one, um, are you aware of the decisions that uh, your uh, loved one would want to have made on their behalf? Perhaps as a healthy person, you would say, I don't even know who would speak for me. So the next step then is thinking about who could make a health care or a personal decision for you if you could not. And certainly when we're dealing with uh, illnesses where cognitive impairment or other limitations may be affected, remember that decision-making abilities might be affected by things like the time of day, uh, stress, circumstances, perhaps medications, maybe an accident or an illness. So making decisions is, uh, is a very broad topic, but to think about who could make that decision for you on your behalf if you would not be able to speak for yourself. So the person that we would say would make that decision is what we call a substitute decision maker. If you have trouble making a care decision, you certainly have the right, everyone has a right to find support from a family member or a friend to help understand the information and communicate your decision. If you have trouble making a decision, even with support, someone will be asked to make a decision for you. This person is called a substitute decision maker. Advanced care planning can help you determine who your substitute decision maker could be and will be, and then ensuring that they have the information that they need from you in order to speak on your behalf. In the province of BC, there are really two types of British, of, of British Columbians. No, there are two types of substitute decision makers we refer to as a temporary substitute decision maker or a representative. So a temporary substitute decision maker is a person chosen by a healthcare provider from a list that the BC uh, government has according to BC laws. On this list, there would be family members and close friends. A temporary substitute decision maker can only be chosen to make a healthcare decision for you, one circumstance, one decision at a time, and it refers to healthcare decisions only. A representative, however, is a person chosen by you using a legal form called a representation agreement, and it is uh, for making health and personal care decisions. So we'll explain what a temporary substitute decision maker is. So this would be the list under BC law, and we call this the default substitute decision maker is for everyone in British Columbia or the TSDM to pick a substitute decision maker. First of all, if you're in an incident or an episode where you're not able to speak for yourself, the healthcare providers will work down this list um, that's defined by BC law to find a person who would qualify to be your temporary substitute decision maker. So number one, and this is the order one to nine, it's not a pick, they would start from the top and move down. Number one would be a spouse or a common law partner. Number two, your temporary substitute decision maker could be one of your adult children. Number three, it could be a parent. Number four, a sibling. Number five, a grandparent. Number six, a grandchild. Number seven, anyone related by birth or adoption. Eight is a close friend. And number nine is a person immediately related by marriage. So all of those nine um, options need to meet, any one of those need to meet the eligibility requirements. So that means, number one, your grandchild, if, if it comes to that, has to be someone who is 19 years of age or older. In other words, a legal adult. They must be capable. There must be no dispute with you. There must be no, con there must have been contact with you in the past 12 months and that they would be willing to comply their duties. So, if this whole list has been um, sought and no one can be reached or qualifies, someone who is authorized by the public guardian and trustee will be chosen. This is a really full list. 
I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but to continue what a gut substitute decision maker looks like. This is key to helping your wishes be known. So having the right person in place is super important. A good substitute decision maker is someone who knows you well. Someone who could honor your wishes and instructions. Someone who could communicate with the healthcare providers. Someone who is calm in a crisis. Someone who could handle a conflict or a disagreement. And someone who's willing and available to take on this role. So if the temporary substitute decision maker list that we just reviewed does not work for you, it's strongly encouraged that you consider making a representation agreement so you can be in charge of selecting your own substitute decision maker. So think and talk. The talking portion of advanced care planning is to talk with the people that you trust. So we may think that our family and friends know what we would want, but let's not assume that. Talk and discuss your ideas, your values, your wishes and beliefs with the people that you trust. With who you trust, thank you. So who do you talk to? Well, first of all, your substitute decision maker that they would be informed, that they consent, that you're on the same page, talk to other ma family members, and talk to your close friends. What do you talk about? Well, you, you talk about the values and the beliefs and wishes for your future care, the very nature of the questions that we had talked about, and what that means to you. Why is that important to you? And talk about who your substitute decision maker is. If, if you've appointed your spouse, that your children would know that. If you have appointed a, a, a member of an extended member of your family, that your family knows this. That the people who matter most to you understand and know who has been appointed. How do you even get to the talk component? Well, here's some suggestions. <clears throat> you could say something like, you know, I was thinking about what happened to Ernie, and it made me realize that Perhaps I don't have this all sorted. Maybe just, you know, I answered some questions about my health care wishes. I was wondering if we could talk about these. I need some help about the future and planning my care. Could you help me? Now, just recognize that um, some of this co conversation and these topics might not be as uh, forefront on the mind of the people that you're talking to. So just, you know, for instance, there might be a movie. There might be a television show where you see an episode. That could be a jumping off point for a conversation. Just know that you will not probably have the whole conversation in one sitting, but to broach the subject in a several occasions is a great starting point. And of course, then to speak with your healthcare providers. Um, this is really important, especially if you have a serious illness, and this is an ongoing conversation. Um, especially if, if your loved one or your family member, if, if we have heart failure, uh, certainly any cognitive uh, disease or dementia, kidney diseases, cancer, and so on, where your health can change, it's very important that your healthcare provider and you have these conversations about your wishes and care. And getting started with your healthcare provider, you can ask questions. If you have a regular family doctor, a specialist, or a nurse practitioner, number one, Book a time with them to understand your health care conditions and help them understand and you understand what your treatment options are. Go into this uh, booking with something prepared. You may want to write down a number of questions. Uh, you may want to even um, invite someone to come with you. Could be your substitute decision maker, could be a family member. It's always good to go with someone who understands uh, the trajectory and be able to ask and hear the responses. Take time to reflect on your answers and the answers that uh, your healthcare provider share with you. What you learn from them may be able to help you think about what matters most as well in your future healthcare and uh, speaking for situations if you were not be able to speak. So once you're ready to share and talk to your healthcare provider, consider two things, what matters most to you? Your values, your beliefs, and your wishes for your future healthcare. This will help your healthcare provider also consider care options that may be aligned with your wishes. 
And of course, your substitute decision maker. If you can share a list with your temporary um, substitute decision maker or who your um, appointed representative is, share that with your healthcare provider as well. And once again, remember, talking to your healthcare provider is an ongoing process. The questions that you may have, the dialogue that you may have, may change, of course, as your healthcare changes as well. Um, thank you. Next slide. This is ongoing. Thank you. I'm going to pass this over to Pam once again. Thanks, Melody. So, yes, uh, we've, we've done the thinking, we've done some of the talking. Now it's about the planning. Uh, so there's two key components to planning. There's the recording your wishes um, and there's the sharing your plan with the people that you trust and your health care providers. So uh, we'll just uh, go over a little bit about what is an advanced care plan. So uh, any advanced care plan has two key components. Uh, one is a written video or audio record of your values, beliefs, and wishes about your health and personal care. And the second is the contact information of your potential temporary substitute decision makers according to the law with notes on who wouldn't qualify and why. So if you have people that uh, would not qualify, you would want to make note of that in, in your advanced care plan. So because temporary substitute decision makers are the default substitute decision makers for everyone in BC, it's important that everyone completes a contact list and includes those notes on who uh, would qualify and not. Um, this list can be shared with your healthcare providers to help them quickly choose a temporary substitute decision maker um, when, when it's needed. An advanced care plan can also include any optional legal forms, some of which we've already mentioned in our presentation, such as a representation agreement, an advanced directive, and medical orders, such as uh, the NoCPR or most. Uh, next slide. Yeah, what, what do you do with your advanced care plan? So the first thing you're going to want to do is, of course, share it with your substitute decision makers, health care providers, and other family members or friends who you feel um, it should be made available to. You should also uh, keep all documents and records together in a place that is easy to find. And a good tip is that uh, first responders actually know to check on or near the fridge, your refrigerator uh, for healthcare documents. So that's a really good place to, to keep them if, uh, if that works for you. And to also bring these documents with you if you go to the hospital. It's uh, very important. So finally, reviewing your advanced care plan is very important. So as mentioned previously, advanced care planning is not a one-time event. It's a lifelong process of thinking, talking, planning, and reviewing. Your advanced care plan is also not set in stone. Uh, you can change your wishes at any time. So uh, we recommend that you review your advanced care plan and all accompanying documents at regular intervals. So for example, uh, once a year when you file your taxes, you may wish to review your health care plans and update as necessary. Um, other occasions where you might want to uh, update your advanced care plan are when your health needs change. Anytime there's some, some major event, you may want to look at the, at the documents again. Um, if you're a substitute decision maker or representative uh, changes, or if your health care provider changes. And how to get started. Very yeah. good. Yes. We have a question in the chat about allowing time to have an in-depth conversation with a health care provider. Do you have any tips around mm -hmm. how you can get health care providers to, to listen and take the time? Yes. Uh, that that's an excellent question. As we know, all of our healthcare providers are quite busy people, um, and so it can be challenging to get them to to speak on this. I would say, uh, as part of a general checkup, would be a good time to do it. Um, or if this is something that you particularly you specifically want to speak to them about, that you would call in advance and let them know that that is what you're asking for. Um, I believe they're still working out how to bill it from the, the, the healthcare provider's perspective, which is part of the issue of, of, of allowing the time. Um, it's, it's hard to, to bill it within the system, but that is changing. 
And um, I would encourage people to just keep asking for it because the more they ask for it, the more the doctors are then able to advocate for it as well. So um, it may be a bit of a systemic change, but on a personal level, I would say um, either, yeah, like I said, at the general annual checkup um, or just um, letting the healthcare provider know in advance that you would like to carve out some time for that. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so how to get started? That's also a very good question. Um, so the BC Center for Palliative Care offers uh, advanced care planning resources that have been um, culturally adapted and translated in multiple languages. So we have the English version, but we also have it translated in traditional Chinese, simplified Chinese and Punjabi. Uh, the center is also um, doing an ongoing project where we are adapting these documents for um, the Hindi language. And I believe these resources will be made of, are, are made available, will be made available to everybody here. Um, so, so the center also offers support uh, and resources uh, to help with each step of the advanced care planning using our, our think talk plan process. So you can see that there are documents that are, are related to each step. And uh, you may also notice on your screen that there are some red asterisks next to some of these documents. That just means that these documents were reviewed for legal accuracy by the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. So that is, um, it's it's just an extra layer of review, making sure that everything is legally, um, uh, you know, on the nose. Page is almost done. Um, so, yes, these resources that we have here, uh, we have the advanced care planning information booklet, what to include in your advanced care plan, example records and stories, which may also be helpful just to get the, the ball rolling. They're all uh, free and easy to download on the website. Again, I also believe it's in the resource package that will be made available here. And um, if you go to the center's website, there is a drop down menu um, on each of these web pages that will help direct you to the language of your choice. So it's it's just very um, we, we've done our best to make it easy to navigate for everybody. Um, and so whichever language you speak um, or prefer or have family members who would prefer, um, you're able to to access it uh, rather easily from from the center. Um, the, the BC Center for Palliative Care also has a couple of short videos on YouTube. Um, so there's the advanced care planning is for everyone and it's as easy as think talk plan. Uh, so they're short, I believe less than five minutes each. So we encourage you to check them out if you are interested in just having uh, a little bit more background on that. Also worth noting is um, there is an annual advanced care planning day. Um, every year in April, this year it's April 17th. Uh, its aim is to raise awareness and normalize conversations about future healthcare wishes and needs. Uh, so the BC Centre heads up the provincial awareness campaign, while nationally it's run by uh, the um, a CPA, CHPCA, uh, Canadian Hospice Oh, Creative right. Care Association. Thank you, Melody. <laughs> I, always, I always mix that one up. <laughs> but yes, um, as you can see here, our theme uh, this year is Life Happens, Be Ready. So following this webinar, uh, we would like to encourage every one of you to begin thinking about what matters most to you and to start sharing that with the people that you trust. Um, having the conversations is actually, it can be the most difficult, uh, but it's the most important part um, of this process. And uh, yeah, so with that, um, we wish you good luck and we wanna thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen to us today. And I think we have plenty of time to take questions, anything that people would like to know about the center or about advanced care planning, um, anything that we're able to, to, uh, to answer, we would love to do that. Thank you. I just see a comment um, regarding getting a referral to a geriatric clinic. Um, there are a few across BC, the specialized seniors clinics um, in the Fraser Health Authority um, and in each health authority across the province. So they are uh, great places to get a referral to. You do have to usually go through your GP or through a clinic uh, to get that referral. But we hear from clients that people spend a lot of time in those appointments, you're able to talk through maybe more of these issues around advanced care planning um, 
and typically you actually see a nurse or a social worker following your visit with a special with the specialist. So I do encourage people um, if that's something you're having a challenge with with your GP, you can get that referral to a clinic. So thanks for mentioning that in the chat. Yeah, so if I can just comment, I thank you, uh, Monica, for the comment there about um, what the lawyers refer to rep agreements and TDSM as healthcare power of attorneys. Uh, yeah, so uh, there certainly there's two different things that we're talking about. So one is we're talking about our healthcare plans and planning for the future. So the think and talk portion, we just can't emphasize that enough that you can go in and sign a form for someone to speak on your behalf and you can have all of all of that notarized. However, um, you may still then be at a point where there's an incident or an emergency of sort and somebody is not there to speak on your behalf. So your wishes and your, what you would want that your healthcare provider knows that and your substitute decision maker, which are typically your family members and your loved ones close to you. Um, yes, a representation agreement, number seven and number nine, um, those are um, representation agreements that talk about personal care, personal care and health care. And I know that the Alzheimer's Society can help you do more of the distinguishment for what might be best for your situation. But not to be confused or dissuaded that you have to go to a lawyer or a notary public. You can have these conversations first and foremost with your family and people who matter most. And that's what we just keep saying. When something happens, who would know what you want and who knows you best to make a decision? And um, the document supports it. But, you know, when life happens, we really want the one who knows us best, who loves us most to come and make those decisions alongside of us. When you're able to access any of the documents, if you have any questions, we just encourage you to follow up with um, our host, the Alzheimer's Society, uh, just to say that if they, they have a good grasp, they have been trained in advanced care planning. If, if there's anything that you would like to refer to more, you're more than welcome to jump on our website and go to resources for individuals and families, any of those links. And uh, we know that you'll find some answers there as well. Thank you. And there, there's a comment thanking you for the, the explanation of the, the who, how you order the appointees um, in the absence of a representation agreement. And thanks. So that's, for, that. un, for many people, that's actually quite an unknown list. Uh, the TDSM or is, is somewhat of a surprise to people that says, you know, if I end up, for me, I like to cycle. So if, you know, I ended up in the hospital because I had an injury, who would speak on my behalf? And, and you know, if, if you don't, have the relationships they start walking down that list and you think oh i don't want my mom for instance to be my healthcare decision maker she's 95 she she would have a crisis thinking i've been in a in, a, in an emergency so it's important to even think about who's on that list and say you know i don't want that stress or this person wouldn't be able to keep their cool in a situation so even the awareness of who's on that list sometimes makes people make a choice about okay now i know i need to actually appoint somebody so <laughs> Somebody asked about the difference between POA and representation agreement. Uh, so they have only a POA. It, do they need to get anything else? Do they need to get that changed? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the power of attorney is something that gives um, the named individual permission and rights for uh, the financial components as well. So uh, a, a representation agreement, depending on the seven or the nine, is about making decisions for healthcare decisions for the individual. When a disease or an illness progresses to the point that all the decisions need to be made on behalf of someone else, then financial healthcare um, living situations can be made by someone with a power of attorney. Mm -hmm. It can be the same person who has power of attorney who is also yes. the representative, but it doesn't have to be. And that's, I think, the key difference. If you want it to be a different person, that's where you would want to make a, a representation agreement. Do you recommend having uh, p appointing people who are, say, multi generational? So if you appoint your spouse, would you also recommend having an adult child or an adult grandchild as well? 
You certainly can. Um, it would be important to note if the decisions that these individuals make must be joint or it would be a and or mm -hmm. that can cause a bit of a challenge if you if you have it so if if the representation is and or it allows either one of the named individuals to speak on your behalf mm -hmm. okay thank you and i guess if you're appointing multiple people you want to make sure that they are in agreement um and of like mind and honoring your wishes. Correct. And somebody's commented that, that they didn't know that there was a BC Centre for Palliative Care and a website, so they're happy to, to learn that information, which is great. <laughs> a lot of people don't know, but um, the centre is about seven years old. So thanks for jumping on the website. You'll learn lots more. Mm -hmm asked if it's good to have both a representation agreement and a enduring power of attorney. I would say in most cases, yes, mm -hmm. I do agree. Mm -hmm. They do cover different and things. Yeah, and certainly uniquely personal to each uh, individual. Mm -hmm. I see somebody mentioning about personal directives. Um, so Melody, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my, my understanding of this is that it really is all about the needs, the care. So like all the things that you would like that you would want to see, um, what kind of care would you like to have in the hospital? What would you like your doctors to know? Um, it's, it's very much along those lines. So it's, it's just being as clear as possible who you are as a patient, what are your needs and cares? So basically, if you're not able to communicate those sort of things, what, what needs to be known about you? Yeah, and I think it would be really clear to jump on our website, like the resources that outlined, and we have some samples and examples of what a um, a, a story or your um, healthcare plan could look like. And there is, you can use a template, but it doesn't have to be a template. It can be a verbal recording. It 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 can be what you need to communicate to those who will speak for you what your wishes are. Um, someone has asked if you can. It is very important to not unstaple a power of attorney or representation agreement if copying. If it's from, particularly if it's from a, I, I think they're talking in this case, if it's a document that's come from a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, often the lawyer will staple them, staple the document together. And sometimes even with a little, I don't know, like a little paper, like a little folded paper in the corner that yes, identifies yes. it and there you go, or from a notary. Triangle. Yes, the blue triangle. Thank you, Arlene. Um, and yes, in that case, uh, it is best not to unstaple it. Um, better to go back to the notary or the lawyer and ask for copies. Mm -hmm. But the, the staple and the blue triangle, all of that helps to identify it as a notarized legal document. Okay. It's important to know. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so I'll just let everybody know as a reminder, if there are any questions that come up following this presentation, you can either reach out to me. My contact information is in the chat. But any dementia related questions that you may have, or if you're looking for resources or support, um, the dementia helpline is a great point of access. So I'll pop that in the chat again, but please do feel comfortable to reach out to us. That is true, Arlene, that these documents are available for free on the BC government website. Yes. And also on, there's a, another excellent website for planning, nidus.ca. Nidus is the organization in British Columbia that was originally involved with helping to develop representation agreements. Mm -hmm. and uh, is a really good website for helping to explain some of the some of the more information about rep agreements and power of attorneys. Yes, yes. highly recommend NIDIS. I found their recorded webinars are very helpful to walk you through the representation agreement. 
Yeah, so it may seem like, you know, I just want you to say we're not competing for business of any kind. Our our passion is to get the resources into your hands, into the hands of the public and those who, who need to be able to speak and advocate. So, again, on our website, we have referred to our supporting uh, British Columbia organizations such as NIDIS and the government. What we have tried to do, however, is to streamline the resources. If you if you go on the pages and you go, oh my gosh, there's all this here. What we have tried to do in the advanced care planning information booklet is to walk you through step by step by step. And you can check out what is relevant to you, where you could find this information, and then what to include in your in your personal plan. Um, the forms are there, but what is relevant to you and what do you need? So our goal is to make this as user friendly as possible. So we hope that that works um, well for you. All right, so I'm going to thank both of you once again for joining us. I think that was a very informative session. And in the meantime, if you do want to access some information, please call the Dementia Helpline as we'll be able to direct you to some of our current resources. Mm -hmm.